Okay, hi everybody. Um, good morning. Uh, I'm going to be talking this morning on common shoulder injuries in the athlete. And I think um, tis the season as we've all returned to our fall sports, you know, whether it's the shoulder dislocation in the football player or AC joint sprain in the soccer goalie or overhead uh, shoulder pain um, or shoulder pain in the overhead athlete like the volleyball player. I think, you know, here, here's the fall sports season and these are all things that um, I've seen um, recently. So um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to first uh, kind of start with the basics. We're going to review some normal shoulder anatomy. We're going to talk a little bit about biomechanics of the shoulder and how injury occurs in, in overhead athletes. Um, and then we're going to talk about some treatment options for, um, for common injuries. <clears throat> so starting off, this is um, a picture of the bony anatomy of the shoulder. And you can see articular cartilage, um, so the humeral head and the glenoid, um, the shaft of the humerus, the scapula, and, the, and then the two bony protuberances off the um, scapulae, the acromion superiorly, um, which is responsible for some impingement some, uh, in some cases, and then the coracoid process anteriorly. Um, <clears throat> most of us know the rotator cuff muscles, four muscles, supraspinatus, um, the most uh, commonly involved muscle, muscle tendon unit in um, impingement as well as tears, subscapularis in the front, and then uh, infraspinatus and teres minor um, in the back is our external rotators. Um, <clears throat> so ligaments, um, the ligaments that you can see here in red, the corticoacromial ligaments, the AC joint ligaments, um, we're going to see um, how they are pathological in AC joint sprains um, mm -hmm. a little bit later. The um, broad... Uh, Ligaments that you see in blue are the glenohumeral ligaments, um, sometimes involved in instability. Um, they act as check reins to shoulder stability. Uh, and then uh, the labrum is seen um, uh, in green. So the glenoid labrum, um, that's something that uh, anybody that sees um, uh, overhead athletes or uh, lots of shoulder sports injuries is familiar with. The glenoid labrum is a ring of cartilage that sits around the, the glenoid fossa it acts like a suction cup, so it creates a negative pressure environment, um, aiding to stability. It also acts um, to deepen the glenoid uh, fossa, and so it's, it's a bumper um, and aids in shoulder stability. Um, <clears throat> normally, um, the glenohumeral joint, and oftentimes, and I'll put this analogy of a golf ball on a golf tee, um, this, is analogy, <coughs> this is an analogy that I think that most athletes or um, people can understand. So the glenoid fossa is like the golf tee, and then the humeral head is like the golf ball. And at any one uh, point in shoulder rotation, the golf tee or the, or the glenoid only covers about 25% of the um, articular cartilage of the humeral head. So that means that we are very reliant on the soft tissue structures around the shoulder, whether it be the glenohumeral ligaments, the labrum, the rotator cuff, to aid in um, <clears throat> stabilizing our shoulder. Um, so the glenohumeral joint is a fine balance between stability and mobility. Um, in these overhead athletes, we have to remember that laxity is physiologic. And for a lot of athletes, especially overhead athletes, like baseball players, um, swimmers, volleyball players, um, a certain amount of maybe increased laxity as compared with the norm is physiological and um, is actually advantageous for some of these athletes. But as soon as um, the pendulum swings and the laxity becomes, um, starts to create instability and tearing and problems, that's when we're in a pathological situation. So why does shoulder instability occur? Um, certainly some of these athletes have congenital reasons um, why their joint laxity might lead to instability. Um, gymnasts are a very common um, example. Um, of this, oftentimes multi-directional instability can lead to micro tears in the capsule and can sometimes lead to um, a secondary rotator cuff impingement. Glenoid dysplasia, meaning when the glenoid isn't fully formed and instead of being a, a cup is, um, is flatter, um, it really is um, like dealing with an incomplete golf tee, um, that can also lead to um, instability. Um, another cause of instability is trauma, and uh, this is something that is usually easily recognized. Um, it's the athlete that um, falls, has an, uh, most of the time anterior shoulder dislocation. Usually there's significant, significant clinical deformity 
um, and reduction either um, on the field or sometimes under sedation in the emergency room is necessary. Um, I'll make one note, if you compare these slides, um, you can see this uh, the slide on the left showing an anterior dislocation. There's a lot more room in the anterior aspect of the shoulder. So most of the time, these dislocations are under the corticoid process um, and very clinically obvious. The posterior dislocation, which can happen, let's say, in the football player that falls on an outstretched arm, or uh, sometimes um, these are uh, injuries are uh, kind of classic in someone that's uh, either undergone a seizure or um, had an electrical shock. Um, these are a little bit less clinically obvious because there's not as much room in the posterior aspect of the shoulder. And the x-ray on the right um, is an x-ray of um, a posterior shoulder dislocation that was missed here in one of the ERs in Reno. Um, came to me four months later um, with a, in a 28-year-old guy who was a pipe fitter, um, at that point on methadone for pain control in his shoulder, when really what should have happened is um, a simple reduction probably would have alleviated a lot of those um, issues. So anyway, he ended up having, having surgery and is, is now doing fine, but that's a situation that really from the start needs to be avoided. Um, if you're at all uncertain um, and there's something that looks just not quite right, but you're not sure, like that x-ray on, on the right, um, a little bit less profound um, in terms of a, a deformity or a problem, then getting an axillary view x-ray um, you know, asking the radiologist to get an, or the x-ray tech to get an axillary view um, is usually the best view to look at um, to determine um, uh, whether or not you have um, uh, an unstable or dislocated shoulder. So what happens in anterior um, instability or with a, a more common anterior dislocation? Um, typically in young athletes, um, you end up with a Bankart lesion or, or a labral tear. Sometimes that can um, involve some bone. You can see over here, um, this is an ant. This is anterior. This is posterior. Okay, so you can see here you have an anterior labral tear, um, or I like that circle there, um, or uh, sometimes a little fleck of bone can come off. Um, when that happens, and when the ball or the humeral head dislocates anteriorly, sometimes the back of the humeral head can get stuck on the front of the um, glenoid rim, creating this um, what's called a hill sax lesion in the back of the humeral head. So this is sort of your typical injury pattern uh, and, and what happens in the majority of cases in young athletes um, who have a shoulder dislocation. Um, so again, humeral head, um, hill sax lesion, anterior labral thing. Um, in older patients, um, so we're talking probably 40, I don't like to classify that as old, but um, sometimes it is in terms of uh, dislocating shoulders. So 40 plus, we worry about rotator cuff tears, um, sometimes a greater tuberosity fracture. So I think it's important in anybody that's had a shoulder dislocation, fast or quick um, or efficient reduction, uh, and then at least a plain x-ray to make sure that we've got um, concentric reduction of the humeral head on the glenoid and to look for any, any um, significant bony changes. So just thinking about these statistics, these are usually at least running through my mind if I see a patient post-shoulder uh, dislocation, there's a 90% recurrence in patients under the age of 20. So the high school-aged football player that comes in that dislocated the shoulder, reduced either on the field or an hour later in the ER, there's a 90% chance that that young athlete is going to dislocate again. So how, did, how should that be managed? Um, you know, I think you talk to the patient, you talk to the family. Um, once we regain normal range of motion and strength, um, that would be the time to either Return to the field if it's early season, mid-season, uh, plus minus um, being stabilized in something like a sully brace, depending on the patient's position, whether it be you know, a football player uh, or another sport. Or um, in somebody that, well, maybe they dislocated at the end of the season and really want to get back for the next season, um, I think proceeding with an MRI and um, considering a labral repair um, just because of that high recurrence rate is certainly worthwhile. And I think I've seen a trend since I've been in practice of, okay, re let's re regain range of motion and strength. Um, but I don't think there's anything wrong with um, an operation or a, or a stabilizing procedure in um, a, a college-aged or high school-aged athlete that's had a, a dislocation, has a labral tear, because it's going to happen again. Um, look at the patients over 40, 10% recurrence rate. So that certainly means 
these are the patients that go to physical therapy. These are not your college level athletes. Um, they may be high level um, recreational athletes, but um, because of the lower recurrence rate, this may be somebody that you send to physical therapy um, and um, strengthen the rotator cuff and, and hopefully it's not gonna happen again. Patients over the age of 60, um, these should be followed for any um, ongoing rotator cuff weakness, just to make sure that uh, Instead of a labral tear, some of these patients can have a rotator cuff tear. So I don't necessarily get an MRI right away in a, in a 60 plus year old who dislocates their shoulder. I will usually have them go through some physical therapy to regain range of motion and strength. And then uh, I do make sure I follow them um, at you know, six weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks post dislocation just to make sure that they've regained range of motion and that they don't have an obvious rotator cuff uh, deficit. Axillary neuropathy, um, we should remember the axillary nerve uh, in um, treating uh, patients who've had a dislocation. 30% incidence of axillary neuropathy in first-time dislocators. It's probably surprisingly high because I think a lot of those uh, uh, are um, injuries um, that get better quickly um, or that may be fairly subtle. The axillary nerve, remember, um, dives into the axilla and around the posterior aspect uh, of the humerus. It provides motor function to the deltoid uh, and also to the teres minor. And you can see this picture on the right. That um, drawing is where the axillary nerve provides sensation to the lateral aspect of the arm. So that's usually a quick test. I compare one side to the other um, and see if they've got uh, intact sensation in the axillary nerve. And that's important to returning these athletes to the field. You do not want to return them to the field even if they've regained range of motion. Um, if they've got some persistence of an axillary neuropathy because the deltoid is protective um, and it is an important muscle in the shoulder uh, for really any athlete. So a posterior dislocation, how does that differ from an anterior dislocation? So again, we, we showed that, um, I talked a little bit about that x-ray um, that's a, a little more subtle in terms of its uh, clinical presentation as well as x-ray findings with a posterior dislocation as there's less room in the back of the shoulder. Typically, the, uh, the mechanism, mechanism of injury is uh, in athletes is a fall on an outstretched arm. Um, and in these uh, athletes, we have see, um, a, sometimes a rotator cuff tear, usually a posterior labral tear, and what's called a reverse hill sax lesion, where the bony deficit or divot is in the front of the humeral head, not the back, because of the um, pattern of instability. So what happens, shoulder should get reduced as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. Um, the patient is usually put in a sling for comfort um, for a week plus. Imaging studies, x-rays always, I think, and that's to include um, an AP, um, a lateral, and then I think most importantly, uh, the axillary view, which this is an axillary um, slice on an MRI, but the axillary x-ray view looks very similar. And typically, um, you can get this sort of uh, golf ball and golf tee image so that you can see um, whether or not the, uh, the shoulder is reduced. Uh, physical therapy uh, or home exercise program to help regain range of motion as well as strength. And then surgery um, certainly is a possibility for those uh, young athletes uh, who are even first time dislocators. So in my practice, um, I typically will consider surgery for patients less than 30 years old with um, shoulder instability, and even a one-time dislocation, especially if um, there's evidence on an MRI of uh, a significant labral tear. Um, with recurrence of instability, I think that what we risk for these athletes is extension of the labral tear, and to me, most importantly, um, the continued articular cartilage deficits and wear and bone loss. I think if you look at these um, patients, Patients who have had one or two shoulder dislocations are a lot easier to treat surgically, and the recurrence rates after a surgical fix are a lot lower than a patient that comes in with 20 plus dislocations, who generally speaking have really significantly worn away articular cartilage, and now maybe that hill sacs defect isn't just a small bone bruise, but maybe now it involves a third of their humeral head. That makes surgery a little bit more challenging, um, but most importantly for the athlete, puts them at a higher risk of recurrent dislocation even after a surgical procedure, which um, really is not a happy situation when somebody is up for two or three of these procedures, um, which usually takes them out of their sport for six months. 
So how should shoulder, shoulder instability be treated, open versus arthroscopic? I think this really should be left you know, up to the surgeon. I think the surgeon decides, well, how do they feel most comfortable treating the instability? Um, open, meaning making an incision, going through the delta pectoral uh, uh, interval, and then repairing that capsular labral com complex. There is nothing wrong with that. I think that um, more and more we find that the arthroscopic approach to these patients um, is, at least in my hands, uh, more helpful and I feel as if um, I can treat some other pathology. So by putting the arthroscope into the shoulder, it's like walking um, in uh, a door into the middle of the room. You can see all four walls. So approaching these cases arthroscopically, I'm able to look at the front of the shoulder, the back of the shoulder, the rotator cuff, um, the entire humeral head, um, the entire glenoid. So we can really do, I think, um, a, an excellent arthroscopic evaluation of all of the potential pathology that maybe this, this athlete uh, or patient has. Um, the ability to fix these injuries, um, whether it be an anterior labral tear, posterior labral tear, slap lesion, rotator cuff tear, can be done all at once, same procedure with you know four or five small portals or incisions around the shoulder through cannulas with um, things like uh, suture passers, which are these lassos on the right. The cannulas are um, these large um, plastic straws that we use. Um, to pass suture and anchors, and then on the left, these suture anchors. Um, are, this is just an example of uh, what these little tacks look like um, that uh, enable us to repair the labor back down to the um, glenoid rim. So this is what it looks like. So let's spend a couple of minutes talking about slap lesions. Um, so slap lesions, it's an acronym that stands for superior labrum anterior to posterior. And if you've read or seen any MRI reports, really in any athlete, this, this word is going to pop up. And it's, um, it's something that uh, I think, unlike an, uh, a well-defined anterior or posterior labral repair in an athlete, these, this diagnosis is something that I think is, is difficult. It's difficult to figure out whether or not somebody is truly symptomatic from a slap lesion and what do we do with a slap lesion. It's some, is it something that we just forget about on the MRI report and gloss over it? Is it something that needs to be referred um, for a surgeon to fix? Um, so what is a slap lesion? Um, generally speaking, um, in athletes, uh, because of this peel back mechanism in overhead athletes, it's basically a superior labral uh, tear. And in a thrower with uh, repetitive overhead motion, the biceps tendon can peel the, can cause a peel back of the superior labrum. Usually this, is, this happens over time and it's not an acute injury. Um, what happens in an overhead athlete is that once the slap lesion occurs, it allows for further anterior laxity and, and torsional failure uh, of the undersurface of the rotator cuff and sometime of the anterior capsule. So it can lead to what we call micro instability and shoulder pain in overhead athletes. The way we test for um, a slap lesion is with this O'Brien's test. And so the arm is put out uh, in a um, anterior position with the thumb down, internally rotated um, uh, as an adducted 10 degrees. We ask the patient to, um, to push up as the examiner pushes down, and with the thumb down, that creates more anterior shoulder pain than when the palm is placed up, that's considered a positive O'Brien sign. Um, and again, um, it's not very specific for slap lesions, uh, but it's somewhat sensitive. Sometimes patients with AC joint pathology also have a positive thumb, O'Brien sign. So the MR arthrogram, um, meaning an MRI um, obtained with a, a, a dye or catalytic injection into the glenohumeral joint, um, is probably the best test. And you can see here on this coronal view, you can see that the arrow is pointing to um, a slap lesion. So now we've got another challenge. We're looking for a slap lesion. We order an MR arthrogram, and now we're trying to figure out what you know, is it positive because we actually have a tear, or is it positive because there's some variance from patient to patient in how our superior labrum is, is actually attached to the glenoid? So again, lots of challenges trying to figure out um, whether or not the slap lesion is real, and if it's real, whether or not it's something that should be fixed um, surgically. So realize that the superior labrum, even if you're not an overhead athlete, usually demonstrates some age or activity-related degenerative change. So the vast majority of patients 
especially those who start to develop osteoarthritis, they're gonna, their MRI is going to read a slap lesion um, or a degenerative superior label tear. Um, certainly, that slap lesion should be treated much differently than your 22-year-old baseball player. Um, the, a normal um, labral recess. Um, so there is some genetic vari variability patient to patient. And if you look at these um, different pictures from right to left, sublabral foramen, sublabral recess under the biceps anchor, as well as even an absent um, superior glenoid um, labrum, all of these are normal, var um, normal variants of, of the superior labrum. Again, um, I think difficult sometimes to determine whether or not, um, let's say this picture here, is this a slap lesion or is this just a normal variant? Um, difficult to tell um, even on the MRI. So that's when you have to match up the patient's um, physical examination and their complaints of pain and their sport with um, what their MRI is showing. So slap lesions typically in baseball players. Um, this is a, a study that was done by the, uh, the group in Houston with the, um, with the Astros. Um, so return to play after treatment of superior labral tears in professional baseball players. Slap lesions have been, termed, have been sometimes termed baseball's most feared injury. Look at the rate of return to prior level of performance. Once these injuries occur, operative versus non-operative, you can see in pictures the non-operative um, patient group actually did better. And so lots of times, you know, I spent a lot of uh, uh, time with, specifically with baseball players, pitchers and overhead athletes, really figuring out what to do. Even if you determine a slap lesion is real, not just a normal variant finding on the MRI, whether or not to treat that patient with physical therapy or um, with a procedure, um, that should be a discussion. That's not a quick and easy uh, answer. So anyway, if you have any of these patients with slap lesions, I think referring them to a, a, an orthopedic sur sur surgeon or a, sh a shoulder specialist is worth it because these aren't easy cases. Um, generally speaking, treatments, we really try non-operative um, surgery only if failed non-operative treatments um, and uh, very well-defined pathology as best can be um, determined. What kind of rotator cuff tears um, happen in overhead athletes? Usually, rotor, rotator cuff tears in the overhead athlete are what are called posta lesions, which are partial articular sided tendon avulsion um, uh, tears. Usually, it's just the undersurface of the rotator cuff, not the whole rotator cuff. I think full thickness um, retracted rotator cuff tears like you might see in a 60 year old really rare in the uh, younger overhead athlete and these undersurface um, tears are usually seen um, because of torsional fiber uh, failure not one fall uh, or trauma um, and sometimes with a, uh, a concomitant slap lesion so let's talk a little bit about impingement um, also something that, that can occur in the overhead athlete doesn't necessarily involve a tear but involves uh, pain, inflammation, and uh, typically it's uh, pressure on the rotator cuff by a surrounding part of the bony anatomy, whether it be the acromion or the coracoid process. Here's the acromion here, and then this is the um, coracoid process, and you can see this picture on the right. Um, usually you get a bursa that's filled with fluid with an irritated rotator cuff, um, usually from, um, from repetitive or overhead use. So here's a volleyball player, um, rotator cuff impingement uh, due to increased uh, glenohumeral joint motion from capsular laxity um, and muscle fatigue. So it's capsular laxity and some of these um, patients that may have some multi-directional instability as well as some rotator cuff or muscle fatigue that can start to cause some rotator cuff impingement. So um, this is again looking at another um, overhead athlete. Um, and you can see how the undersurface of the rotator cuff, um, as well as the posterior superior aspect of the labrum, can come into contact during the late cocking or acceleration phase um, and can cause some irritation, fraying, um, uh, and shoulder pain. So, our treatments um, improve and optimize our throwing mechanics, work on core strengthening, scapular control, and stretch the posterior capsule, the capsule if it's tight because this can lead to uh, increased internal impingement. Um, really rarely, if ever, uh, take these patients to, um, to surgery unless, again, they have failed a long course of non-operative care 
Um, and at that time, uh, typically any label pathology will be addressed, as well as undersurface rotator cuff pathology. Usually this involves a grounding, but it's really the rare uh, patient with, uh, with impingement, whether it be sub, uh, coracoid, subacromial, or internal that, that goes to surgery, especially during their athletic career. Um, so just um, a few more minutes here on some um, remaining uh, and common uh, uh, injuries. So acromioclavicular joint injuries, AC joint injuries, involve an, uh, an injury to the ligament complex that you can see here. So you can see the um, coracoclavicular ligaments here. You can see the AC joint ligaments here. Um, so how should these be treated? Usually these involve a direct impact injury. Um, common in football players, um, common sometimes in um, bikers, soccer goalies. Usually they come in with a bump on their shoulder. The x-ray shows some elevation of the distal clavicle relative to the um, medial acromion. Um, there's a classification system, pretty classic Rockwood classification. Um, and this is pretty easily easy to find. Um, the type three injuries, they're mostly what we see um, in terms of what comes in with an obvious bump on the shoulder uh, and treatment for them is really controversial. The grade one and grade two injuries are usually a sprain or a partial tear of the acromioclavicular uh, ligament. Sometimes the grade twos uh, will show uh, with a small bump. These are treated non-operatively. A sling for comfort when they regain range of motion as well as strength, they can re return to play. It's the grade threes where you have this obvious um, bump. Um, should you fix it? Should you not? Should you do it um, acutely? Should you fix? Should you let them play and then they come back to you in six months or a year when they're more symptomatic? Um, I still think there's a big role for um, non-operative treatment in these grade three injuries. Generally speaking, they do, I think, really well. Um, it can return to pre-injury um, level of competition. Um, so this is usually what I do, um, non-operative, sling for comfort, ice range of motion and strengthening, return to play in one to four weeks, depending on their symptoms. Um, if it's an operative grade three, plus injury, the return to play is, uh, is typically four to six months. So this is a big decision for some of these athletes to have this, this fixed. Surgery for acromioclavicular joint injuries has gotten better. Um, it's arthroscopic assisted, um, so it's now avoiding a big incision in the front of the shoulder. Um, but um, it's not always as successful as, as we want it to be. I find it, um, even though the fixation devices have become better, Usually I see quite a bit of spring back um, because injuries are treated with a combination of suture and metal buttons, as well as usually a soft tissue graft, um, like uh, either a hamstring tendon or a cadaver ankle tendon. Um, and oftentimes there's a little bit of spring back. So um, I don't tell patients that I'm gonna take to surgery for an acromioclavicular joint fixation that they're gonna look normal and that bump's gonna go away completely. Um, so I think in, in a significant grade three or certainly grade fives, surgery is worth it. It's successful, um, but um, it never comes with a complete um, resolution of the clinical deformity, and it's usually six months out of their uh, sport of choice. So um, in summary, uh, I think listen to the patient. That's number one. These athletes are, are all different. They're uh, different ages. They, have to, they play different sports. They've got certainly different aspirations. Do they want to make it to the end of their senior year season? Do they want to play in college, I think. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to athletes and their family in the office, and I, I really try to get an idea of kind of what their goals are, short-term and long-term, and I think that really plays an important role in trying to figure out how to treat some of these injuries, whether or not you have a positive uh, MRI or, or otherwise. Inspection, looking at uh, deformity, um, looking at muscle strength, range of motion, um, symptoms, of, symptoms of instability, a good neurovascular exam, uh, remember we, we touched on the axillary uh, nerve injury and the dislocators, that's important to assess too in, ter in uh, determining return to play. Um, certainly, um, if anybody has any uh, cases or questions, it's easy enough to communicate these days by uh, email or text. Um, I never mind a phone call in the office, um, certainly from you guys who are, who are in outlying um, areas, feel free to, um, to call. I never mind picking up the phone call from uh, picking up the phone from somebody just wanting to know, hey, I've got this. How sh how should I manage it? Um, so certainly um, open and available to you guys anytime. Thanks. Questions.
see a few. <laughs> Go ahead, throw your mouth. Um, Oahe? Um, I think your uh, microphone in your room might be on mute. Krista. <clears throat> Krista, did you have a question? Uh, of course. <laughs> uh, hey. So out here, the, it, we oftentimes have a problem deciding what to order as far as the MRI. So they made us this like little nifty cheat sheet on what to order. But for the slap lesion, we have to order the arthrogram, of course. Um, but what happens if it wasn't a slap lesion and we should have really ordered without IV contrast? Is the arthrogram of any value then or do we have to get a whole nother MRI? So I think that's a great question. I think really in any of these young athletes, slap lesion, anterior label tear, posterior label tear, um, even looking for an undersurface pasta rotator cuff tear. In any young athlete, I will order an MR arthrogram. I think it increases the um, sensitivity of the study um, and the specificity really looking for uh, labral pathology. So young athlete, MR arthrogram. Good. Are there any other questions? Okay, I have one. So I see a lot of young men and women who are not high-level athletes, but they're recreational athletes. And they come in, um, sometimes they actually walk in with their dislocation, <laughs> and if they've fallen off their skateboard on campus. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they come in a week or so later, even a couple days, you know, in their sling, arm really hurts. My, one of my patients either still don't have insurance, they have something that I can't get them to someone easily like Kaiser. Mm -hmm. And so I say, well, you know, you had a dislocation, you have this high rate of, you probably ought to talk to an orthopedic surgeon about your options. And they say, no, I can't. I can't leave school, I can't drive to Roseville, like, whatever reason. I say, okay, well, let's get it calmed down a little bit and do some physical therapy. I can't afford it. <laughs> can't go to physical therapy. <laughs> so the physical therapists have given me, Randy, who was here last week, a nice handout on some home shoulder stuff. And remarkably, I'll see him in about three weeks, a lot of these kids, and they're like, I feel fine. I feel great. I, I don't want to see anybody. I'm not driving down there now for sure. I canceled the appointment I had for Thanksgiving. <laughs> and my, you know, I, I say, look, this is very possible. This could happen again. They're not, they're not going to go someplace else. What should I tell them in terms of, should they keep it on the shoulder program forever? Should they avoid certain things? Should I say, go do whatever you want when it happens again, then go and see the surgeon? What do you do with those? Sort of a, how can I direct them for trying to <laughs> not have it continue to happen again? Or is it just going to be a done deal? Yeah, no, I think that's a, also a... Um, Really good question. I think, you know, for, for those patients, and you're seeing a lot of college yeah. level college athletes. Age. So, okay, yeah. so college age, single dislocation, there is a very high chance that that person has a labral tear. I mean, I think it's the rare case where, oh, the capsule just got stretched out. Mm -hmm. that, that's pretty rare. So let's just assume that, 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 that these kids have a labral tear. Um, they probably um, are almost always going to have a little apprehension in this assuming it's anterior in this extreme position, they should continue a, um, a rotator cuff program, of course, if they can continue it for a long time, that's helpful, you know, maintaining good shoulder strength because the rotator cuff is a, um, a good secondary stabilizer. So you want to make sure you, have, you maintain and have a good um, uh, rotator cuff um, and scapular uh, stabilizer on glove. With a lot of these kids, they're going to do what they want you know, they're, they're going to say, great, it was, the shoulder dislocation was important last month, but now I've moved on in life, and they're probably going to forget it. I think they'll probably end up stopping themselves from certain activities because of the apprehension. Um, but it is, I would say, in a large percentage of those uh, kids, if, even if they're playing a recreational ultimate frisbee or a contact sport, it may happen again. And they just need to be aware. They just need to be, I think, aware of that as long as they can 
maintain their shoulder program, that's good for them. But lots of these kids, they're not going to do it three times a week for the rest of their lives. <laughs> but give it a try. You know, I would say, you know, you just counsel them as much as possible. You know, and uh, I end up seeing a lot of people who come and say, oh, you know, I'm, how many times has the shoulder been up? Um, 50? 40? You know, I, and usually if the dislocations continue to happen, and then all of a sudden the dislocation happens in your sleep, that will force, you know, I don't like to, for it to get to that point because that usually means there's a lot of bone damage when it comes out that easily. Um, but sometimes that's what it takes before people come in. Does anyone have any other questions? Dr. Malcarney, when we send somebody in to see you, would you rather that we just do the imaging there in Reno? Would that be more convenient for you? Um, you know, I usually try to do what's ever convenient for the patient. If there, if you can get a, a good quality MR arthrogram where you are, um, then fine, that saves the patient a trip, and then they come down with their MR arthrogram on a CD. Now that's assuming that the CD opens and works when they show up. So um, it really, uh, I think if you've got a, a reliable um, radiologist and MR scanner, great, do it there. Um, especially if the, the discs will, will open. That's the biggest problem is when somebody comes in and I can't see the imaging. Um, so I don't care, it, it doesn't have to be done in Reno. Um, I do have access to all of the Reno uh, hospitals, you know, through the through the web. So it's very easy for me to access anybody that's had anything done in Reno. And I can always I can do any clean X-rays in my office. I'll, I, I do them on, on almost everybody. So um, I will repeat the X-rays. It's just sometimes an expense for the patient having to repeat the MRI. Okay. Any other questions, cases? All right, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Have a good day.